We had it tested. It's coated with insulin. That's how she killed him. And they just take his word for it. I hired a guy and he found this in her bathroom. And the police are like, oh yeah, clearly you're correct. Certainly this was never planted or found somewhere else and is definitely usable evidence. I trust you, sir. This video is sponsored by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at Mubi.com slash skip intro. Right. What are they? Where do they come from? And like magnets, how do they work? Well, some people are quick to say that they know their rights before pointing to their pocket constitution and babbling free speech from a mouthful of foam. It turns out that many people don't really understand how their rights work in practice. While lawyers spend their careers debating when and where rights apply, most Americans learn what they think they know about the criminal legal system from television and popular culture. Which is probably why most of us think of rights in the simple yet profound terms of esteemed philosopher James Morgan McGill. Did you know that you have rights? The Constitution says you do, and so do I. Well said, sir. Welcome back to a very special two-part episode of Copaganda, a series of videos exploring the portrayal of the police on television and how that portrayal has shaped our understanding of who the police are and what they should be. We've covered shows from across the spectrum, from Brooklyn Nine-Nine to Paw Patrol to how cop shows cover fentanyl. There's a playlist up in the corner here if you have a day to kill, or if you just want to kill your will to live in America, or why not both? Today, we're continuing our discussion of the most famous cop show franchise in television history. This little show called Law & Order. Maybe you've heard of it. In part one, we talked about Law & Order in a bit of a different way for this series. We didn't really talk about the cops at all. As you may have heard, in the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups, the police who investigate crime and the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders. And those district attorneys, the ones who prosecute offenders, don't really seem to get as much scrutiny when it comes to issues of crime and policing, despite the fact that they are equally important and actually not, not all that separate at all. You work for me at my discretion. Your sole purpose in this process is to bring me a case I can prosecute, not one I have to fix. In part one, we talked about the dickish origins of the Law & Order franchise and political term, ejaculating from Dick Nixon's mouth as a direct facial on the gains of the civil rights movement and starting the tough or hard on crime era that really weirdly was the law of the land while violent crime popped a chubby on American society. I am 31 years old. We looked at how Law & Order reinforces the idea that contact with the criminal legal system is evidence of guilt itself, by juicing its stats when it comes to trials and dismissing the coercive nature of plea deals. And when you have that kind of certainty in a defendant's guilt, anything that gets in the way, like pesky little civil rights, are technicalities or obstacles. Which unfortunately mirrors where our real-life legal system has been trending for the past 70 years or so. We talked about the decades-long effort at the Supreme Court to hollow out those rights until we're now at a point where if you say, just get me a lawyer, dog, cops can claim, legally, that you weren't exercising your constitutional right to counsel, but instead were probably asking for a canine lawyer. Because that's the kind of serious big boy country we live in. I successfully and thoroughly destroyed Law & Order. I exposed it as a police propaganda scam and debunked its portrayal of the criminal legal system. And I believe that gives me YouTube title bingo. So by the arcane laws that govern this platform, I am now sworn to make videos about cop shows I hate until the end of my days. Bad news for me. Good news for you though, you little content gremlin. I focused pretty intensely on Miranda rights in part one, because I think it's a really clear case study for how Law & Order distorts the public's understanding and support for a very famous and popular civil right. But it's hardly the only right to get the Law & Order treatment. You see, Law & Order is, as Dick Wolf claims, I am kind of unabashedly pro law enforcement. And when your show is unabashedly pro-law enforcement, you kind of have to be a little anti-rights. Because rights are protections from the state. And cops, well, they work for the state. Rights make the jobs of cops and prosecutors harder. By design. Didn't know that the Bill of Rights was written to make your life easier. Now, it's okay for them to have to work hard. I promise. They actually love hard work. Cops might complain about how there aren't enough of them, but there are only so many counterfeit overtime hours to go around. Prosecutors complain about how overworked they are, but they could just dismiss some cases and work less if they wanted to. Most of them are misdemeanors that won't result in any legal penalties anyways. But 
you know. They're just so committed to mass incarceration. They're in it for the love of the game, baby. The prosecutors, the workload, the cases are so high. The system is piling. It's like, you can just miss this shit. The only thing, yeah. like the prosecutors and the judges can get rid of this shit. Okay, the defense attorneys are the only ones here forced with this caseload, but prosecutors have the power to choose not to prosecute to something, to get rid of it, to treat it like a violation, to decline to prosecute, all these different things, and they have they have all the power. That's Ule Ulleran, an activist lawyer and former New York City public defender. Like she did in part one, she's going to help us understand how criminal courts affect normal, everyday people caught in their web. And we'll also be talking to Rianne and Hamam again, who hosts 5 to 4, a podcast about how much the Supreme Court sucks, to understand how this system has been shaped by the musings of nine robed weirdos. The Supreme Court has given a green light to uh, just an untold amount of harm that the police enacts on people and communities every single day and has made normal. And if you're interested in what those two have to say, boy, do I have the thing for you. It's called my Patreon, and you can watch my full interviews with Rhiannon and Olay there. Also, I need to pay my bills. With their help, we're going to look at three other fundamental rights that you have. Rights that Law & Order hates. And the way the franchise twists and uses those rights to reinforce harmful ideas about our criminal legal system. We're going to pick up right where we left off in part one, talking about procedure before getting broader and broader until you question the very fabric of reality. At least that's what watching Law & Order does to me. While my goal is for this video to stand on its own, I am going to be building off of some points from part one. And if you want to fully understand the guilty until proven innocent idea that is the backbone of the franchise, you might want to check that video out first. Or check it out later. Or check it out tomorrow. I, I really don't care. I just make the videos. So here's a thought exercise. Say you're arrested for a murder. On the one hand, the prosecution has a witness who will testify that you once said about the victim, that guy deserves to die. On the other hand, the prosecution also has evidence that the murder weapon belonged to someone else, and the police found it bloodied in that person's house. In a case where a jury is supposed to convict beyond the shadow of a doubt, feels like relevant information, right? At the very least, there's another suspect. And I think a reasonable person might think that the weapon is stronger evidence than the witness testimony against you. However, your defense team doesn't know about the weapon. So what does the prosecution do? Now, if you watch part one of this episode, you probably have a good idea what the answer is, but a little bit of background. This is what's called Brady material, named after the 1963 Supreme Court case Brady v. Maryland, where the court ruled that prosecutors withholding exculpatory evidence violates due process. That is, evidence that could potentially be used by the defense to exonerate their client. Gotta hand that over. Your Honor, something very disturbing has just been brought to my attention. The DA's office has been withholding evidence that exonerates my client. And I guess that makes sense, right? Prosecutors have a close relationship with the police, and thus access to way more information than a defense attorney could. Besides, if prosecutors weren't sure that this was the right guy, why are they trying them? In the titular Brady v. Maryland, John Leo Brady was convicted of first-degree murder after prosecutors suppressed evidence that his accomplice confessed to the murder himself. Which is kind of a big deal! <laughs> As Justice William O. Douglas laid it out in the majority opinion, quote, Society wins not only when the guilty are convicted, but when criminal trials are fair. Our system of the administration of justice suffers when any accused is treated unfairly. We stan our problematic King William O. Douglas. Married a just disturbing number of his 22-year-old law students, but pretty good on the law. Brady violations are a big deal. In the 1995 case Kyles v. Whiteley, the Supreme Court even went so far as to rule that prosecutors cannot claim ignorance. This is an affirmative duty. You can't just say, oh, I didn't know that we had exculpatory evidence, or that you knew but you didn't think that it was important enough to hand over. Jessica Brand, the legal director for the Justice Collaborative, laid it out this way in the appeal. Quote, Making prosecutors immune from Brady when the material is in the police or analyst's file would create perverse incentives for prosecutors not to to know about information favorable to the defense. But you'd be forgiven for thinking Brady violations just aren't that big a deal from watching Law & Order. But I'd err on the side of caution and turn over what we know. And give this three-time rapist a chance to bluff a jury. That can't be a consideration. Oh, it sure as hell can. At the risk of committing reversible error? How many times do we want to retry Munoz? As many times as it takes. 
we're legally, morally, and ethically entitled to keep this information from him. And that's exactly what we're going to do. While McCoy is called out on his Brady violations all the time, the show frames them as a... Uh, eh. I was... I wrote big whoopsie daisy, no harm, no foul in the script, but I don't even know if they go that far. It's potentially exculpatory. Under Brady, we're obliged to turn it over. If it were exculpatory, nowhere do the canons of ethics say that we have to turn over irrelevant and potentially misleading evidence. I want to convict this kid too, Jack, but we're walking a very fine line here. The law says I don't have to give it to them, Claire. And besides, I don't want to. There's this season seven episode where McCoy knowingly and willingly withholds exculpatory evidence because he knows who did the crime. Turning over this evidence to the defense is just gonna send the jury on a wild goose chase and get their little baby heads all jumbled. In short, it make his job harder. You think that Heidi Ellison knew what was going on? I don't know. Well, if she did, Got a new murder suspect now. Duval is not a suspect. He was on a plane to L.A. while Eddie Newman was dumping a barong in Islip. I'm sure the defense will be happy to tell you how Duval tossed it out his airplane window. Why well, give him that chance? This whole thing's just a dead end. None of it has to go to the defense. This turns into a whole ass thing in the episode. With about half of the episode dedicated to burying this evidence and proving that it's not Brady material, even though it's obviously information that the defense would want. That the district attorney has such evidence, but has failed to turn it over. How do you know that, Mr. Gordon? That doesn't matter. What matters is what we don't know because of the duplicity of the prosecutors. Mr. McCoy, what about this evidence? Are we gonna turn it over? We're going to do everything that the law requires. I mean, just. Just look how sad he is when he finds out he has to give evidence to the defense. I order disclosure of all evidence and all materials sought by the defense. They're in my chambers, Mr. Gordon. Come by any time. They're just, they're giving the defense access to the same evidence they have, and he's just like, Oh man, this messes everything up. Maybe if the defense having the same information as you kills your case, it, your case was trash. But then the story just kind of, moves on. While the evidence McCoy suppresses is deemed Brady material, there are no consequences, and it has absolutely no bearing on the jury's verdict in the end. And this kind of nonchalance in violating Brady is so rampant that a season earlier, when McCoy has to defend himself against an accusation of Brady violation, the ADA can't even pretend that he doesn't do this kind of thing all the time. Have you ever seen the defendant McCoy withhold exculpatory material? Yes. You're gonna say that? I have to say that. I didn't believe I had a duty to disclose. He didn't believe he had a duty to disclose. Does that help? Not if you say it like that. Now, technically it is illegal for prosecutors to withhold Brady information in real life, but like on Law & Order, Nothing really ever happens if they do. The system is set up set up with all kind of stuff like that, like the like harmless error, like when they'll find some 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 uh, somebody appeals something to the courts, like hey, this thing happened, this was wrong, blah blah blah, my rights was violated, and the court says, yeah, it was, but I assure you, I was gonna send your ass to jail anyway. So harmless error. <laughs> In 1984, John Thompson was charged with killing a prominent New Orleans businessman. In order to help convince juries of Thompson's guilt, the district attorney charged him with armed robbery first, securing a 50-year sentence based solely on eyewitness testimony. I mean, on the one hand, the guy who did the armed robbery was black, and John Thompson, also black, and it's Louisiana, so tomato, tomato. Woo. But this armed robbery conviction meant that Thompson was precluded from testifying in his own defense in the murder trial, where he was found guilty and sentenced to death. As messed up as that is, it wasn't the only shady behavior from the district attorney's office. They also hid a blood sample from the robbery that didn't match Thompson at all. Furthermore, in the murder trial, prosecutors failed to disclose the full nature of their eyewitness testimony. One of the eyewitnesses implied that they only came forward because of a cash reward. After nearly 20 years on death row, Thompson's convictions were thrown out, and he was eventually retried and acquitted. Thompson was able to sue, and he won $14 million. Not enough, but it's a start. But then the Supreme Court stepped in, and in an opinion written by Clarence Thomas, decided that Thompson didn't prove a pattern of Brady violations, so actually it was just a big whoopsie-daisy, and they took all of his money away. Okay, so what happens? Can you sue the prosecutor for doing that? Well, the Supreme Court has cases that say, no, not really. 
right? Um, so what does it mean then? You know, what is the what is the remedy? Sure, if you can, you know, get your claim into courts so that they look at the evidence that the prosecutor had, maybe your conviction gets overturned. But again, that's that's a that years time long spent process. in prison. Right, exactly. Yeah. So how did billionaire bootlicker Clarence Thomas come to this conclusion? Especially when Louisiana courts had overturned at least 36 wrongful convictions from this district over the years on the basis of withholding Brady material. Well, he's a real piece of shit, that's how. As journalist Radley Balco wrote in the Washington Post in 2015, Thompson didn't prove a pattern because other wrongly convicted people had tried that argument and been shot down in the Court of Appeals because the Fifth Circuit said prosecutors had absolute immunity. In Balco's words, quote, given that the wrongly convicted in New Orleans had been denied the ability to sue prosecutors due to absolute immunity and the government that employs them, Clarence Thomas argues that sanctions from the state bar are sufficient to deter prosecutors prosecutors from committing misconduct. Balco notes that the Louisiana DA's office is a place where, quote, prosecutors hang nooses on their walls, decorate their desks with miniature electric chairs, and give one another plaques engraved with hypodermic needles upon winning death sentences. But I'm sure that this absolute lack of consequences and accountability will totally change that. Yeah, I'd say that'll do it. Yeah, I'd say that would do it. Yeah, um, yeah, that'll help a little. Look at Ben. He's going, yeah, that'll help a little. So to be clear, the win for John Thompson was not being wrongfully executed. You know, after being imprisoned for a huge chunk of his life, Clarence Thomas says, you should be happy with that. Don't get greedy. Before hopping on a private jet with a billionaire who pays for all his vacations and owns just a very weird amount of Nazi memorabilia. And in food news, You've had enough to eat today. Or you can take the case of Cameron Todd Willingham, who was convicted and put to death for the arson killing of his children in Texas. As it turns out, the fire science that confirmed it was arson was disproven. But more importantly, prosecutor John Jackson had built his case on the testimony of a jailhouse snitch named Johnny Webb, one he'd coerce with plea deals. Again, we talked about that in part one. Writing in The Intercept in 2017, journalist Jordan Smith lays it out this way. Quote, records amassed by the Bar Association and the Innocence Project, including lengthy correspondence between Jackson and Webb, spanning roughly a decade, strongly suggests not only that it was at least implied to Webb that he would receive a reduced sentence for his testimony, but also that Jackson went to great lengths to make that happen. Moreover, Webb now insists that his trial testimony was false and compelled by Jackson. As Clarence Thomas wanted them to do, the Texas Bar actually tried to hold prosecutor John Jackson accountable, but a jury cleared him in 2017. The trial was the culmination of more than a decade of investigation by the Innocence Project, which speaks to just how difficult it is to win any kind of remedy for a Brady violation. Police have qualified immunity. Qualified meaning like there are in theory, legal conditions that have to be met for a police officer to be immune from lawsuit. Prosecutors and judges have what's called total immunity. It's not qualified. Any decision that a prosecutor makes according to these laws on immunity, these judge-made doctrines on immunity. Uh, I feel like they shouldn't be able those... to declare that they are just like, I, I didn't do it. That I can't right. be sued. I'm always right. good. Don't worry about right, it. Right, right. Yeah. So it's that like any decision made in their official capacity, right? Any decision that the prosecutor made as a prosecutor, they cannot be sued for. Any decision that a judge made as a judge, they cannot be sued for. And even if you can prove it and convince a jury, the penalties for prosecutors are laughable. In 2013, four years earlier, that same Texas bar convicted prosecutor Ken Anderson in what The Guardian describes as, quote, the first prosecutor in the country to be imprisoned for deliberately convicting an innocent person when, quote, he withheld evidence crucial to the defense of an accused murderer that resulted in the defendant spending 25 years in prison. That prosecutor's penalty? five years in jail. I'm, I'm sorry, did I say five years? I meant five days. You know, one day for every five years in prison for the defendant. Yeah, that's the best case scenario. The Supreme Court has repeatedly increased the bar for Brady violations as well. As recently as 2016's Turner v. United States, the court ruled that while prosecutors had withheld Brady material from the defense, it was fine, since it probably wouldn't have changed the jury's mind anyways. As Jessica Brand wrote for Slate, 
quote, while everyone, including the government, agreed that prosecutors should have turned over the evidence at trial, the justices upheld the convictions. In his opinion, Justice Stephen Breyer wrote that the illegally suppressed evidence was probably not strong enough to overcome the government's group attack theory, the cornerstone of its case. In other words, no harm, no foul. Yeah, the prosecutor should have turned over that evidence that somebody else did it, but would it really have changed the jury's mind? I'm not sure, right? Like that's just a random rule that, that judges have made up, right? They literally go, convince me that I was gonna let you out of jail. Convince me, tell me I, I was gonna let you out. No, it was gonna be me, I, I promise That you. wasn't gonna be me, yeah, no, <laughs> no. And just like in real life, McCoy never suffers consequences for his Brady violations on Law & Order. In one episode, a man confesses to the serial murder of black boys. The problem is that McCoy has already sent a guy away for this crime, five years earlier, a guy named Andrew Dillard. Tell him your staff is so good they can even convict an innocent man. Whoops! Once he's released, Dillard sues McCoy for $50 million, which is a number I'm supposed to take seriously, but whatever. My client is referring to our claim that you intentionally engaged in a malicious and wrongful process Execution. Intentionally, I don't like what happened, but my conscience is clear. What about your memory? This statement was taken by a detective two months before Mr. Dillard's trial. It was never turned over to the defense. McCoy is flabbergasted. How could this ever happen? He's always right. How could he have made such a grave error? Turns out it was his old ADA who was the culprit of this Brady violation, which she did to confirm a conviction since they already knew that they had the right guy. How many times have I seen you reject unreliable witnesses? How many times have I seen you give experts a little pep talk? How many times have I seen you use a footnote to the fine print of the CPL to avoid giving something to the defense? You crossed the line I never came near. Get off it, Jack. You know what I did. Exactly what you wanted me to. Which is obviously something that McCoy would never do, except the other times that he did it that I talked about earlier. Haven't you heard? I personally deliberately suppressed evidence. It's ridiculous. Right. Right? That's a ringing endorsement. McCoy is so disgusted with her that he actually gets her arrested and she goes to prison for six months. Hilarious. According to our formula from earlier, she should have been in jail for like one day. And even though we get some accountability here, it's still portrayed by the show as not really a good outcome since now every defendant she convicted is going to appeal. Facilitation in the fourth degree. She does six months and gives up her license. I got habeas motions on my desk from every defendant she ever came to. I'll go through them. You bet you will. Oh no, more innocent people might get out of prison. This is the worst possible outcome. Law and Order not only endorses the unjust status quo when it comes to Brady material, but actively twists its narratives to justify it. Here's an episode from season 16 where an undercover cop is murdered after her identity is leaked to the news. McCoy charges a man named Eric Lund with manslaughter, but the defense discovers evidence that proves that he was not the source of the leak that got the cop killed. It's exculpatory Brady material that should have been surrendered to the defense. Mr. McCoy, we can recheck our files. I suppose it's possible something was overlooked or intentionally withheld. That's absurd. I've never seen this document before. It was on a hard drive delivered to the DA. A signed courier slip confirms they received it, but this email was never turned over to the defense. Don't worry though. It turns out that it was all an elaborate conspiracy that involved tampering with the prosecution's hard drive and changing the metadata to fake that the evidence had been withheld. And all of that was done to cover up for some Democrat congressman who had leaked the undercover cop's name to the media because she was the daughter of his political opponent, a Republican. Who do you think you are, McCoy? Just who the hell do you think you're talking to? So actually, when you think about it, Brady is really just one of those loopholes or technicalities easily swindled by genius criminal masterminds of the radical left. Not to be confused with the prosecutorial masterminds who find elaborate ways of hiding Brady material in real life. I can see why you would get those confused. I want everybody, I've had this conversation with people, I need us to take technicality out of our language altogether. Because when, like, ooh, I actually, oh, I, I was watching that attack for propaganda just two days ago and, and, and they said that on the TV and my boyfriend was like, oh, it's a technicality. And I was like, procedural right, goddammit. <laughs> constitutional <laughs> right. <to> like, <laughs> oh, you violated their constitutional rights. Oh, fucking technicality. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> no, it's a, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. <laughs> now, it's easy to laugh at how silly Law & Order is here. But 
how many viewers have any other baseline for understanding something like a Brady violation? And this is a real right that is being steamrolled by prosecutors across the country. In the words of Jessica Brand one more time, quote, ask any public defender in the country and they will tell you that Brady violations occur regularly in the courthouse. The National Registry of Exonerations estimates that over 50% of wrongful convictions occur because of official misconduct. At best, prosecutors commit Brady violations because they are fallible, and they suffer from confirmation bias, which leads them to focus on evidence that validates what they already believe. At worst, they care only about conviction rates. And as former Ninth Circuit appellate judge Alex Kaczynski believes, they consider Brady violations feathers in their caps. Brady violations are all rather technical, though. Let's go bigger picture. Can the police search you whenever they want for whatever reason and then use whatever they find to send you to prison? One of the most fundamental rights you have in this country is the idea that the government can't come and take your shit. I think you could make a reasonable argument that that's why this country became a country in the first place. This idea is enshrined in the Fourth Amendment, which protects people from what are called unreasonable search and seizures, barring the police or other officials of the state from barging into your home and taking your stuff. I can think of a thousand reasons people might not want cops in their apartment. Yeah, illegal drugs, unregistered guns. That's the attitude that makes the Fourth Amendment such a good idea. Anything that the police seize or find during an unlawful search becomes what is called fruit of the poisonous tree. Because uh, lawyers like to talk all fancy-like. Honestly, I'm a little surprised it's not Latin. Fruit of the poisonous tree doesn't just apply to the Fourth Amendment, but any evidence found in an unlawful way. And comes up a lot on Law & Order when talking about the coerced confessions we discussed in part one. If he coerced the first confession, it is still fruit of the poisonous tree. What fruit? Was it some stupid technicality? The Fourth Amendment and the jurisprudence around it is possibly the most cop-relevant law there is, so it should be no surprise that it comes up a lot on Law & Order. <sighs> this flies in the face of the Fourth Amendment. Barnett's attorney's on the horn with every city official he can think of screaming Fourth Amendment violation. That son of a bitch <laughs> is swimming in it. You ever hear of the Fourth Amendment? A couple of overzealous cops got a little over-anxious and they stepped all over hell. They trampled my client's Fourth Amendment rights. Evidence obtained outside of the Fourth Amendment is generally inadmissible in court under what's called the exclusionary rule. So, in theory, prosecutors have a vested interest in making sure that cops get their evidence the right way. Why would you need to do that? There's no crime scene exception to the Fourth Amendment. We need to keep our searches legal. And when the police do step over the line, the show is quick to show judges throwing that evidence out in court. All right, I've heard enough. I agree with the defense. Your Honor, this is a technicality. It's inevitable they would have found the earring. The application to suppress is granted. Thank you. It follows that whatever they recovered from my client's apartment, the hair and the knives, are fruit of the poison tree and must be excluded as well. Agreed. I think it's telling that when this evidence is thrown out, like with Brady material, it never seems to actually sink the prosecution's case. Again, there are only 34 not guilty verdicts returned through the first 450 episodes of the series. And I think that this has two important effects. First, it portrays the system as working very hard to uphold your Fourth Amendment rights. And second, it gives viewers the distinct impression that even if they are violated, it doesn't really change anything. In the charge of murder in the second degree, we find the defendant, Niles Harper, guilty. The case remains largely unaffected, the bad guy still goes away, and that illegal search and seizure becomes fine print in the terms of service for American society. You want out? Are you saying you want out? <laughs> fine, you don't want to be part of this? Then just sign right here. No, you didn't read it! This says we don't ever have to let you out and then we can do whatever we want! Damn it, why won't it read? But, and stop me if you've heard this before, not how it actually works. Oh, you have heard that before. My bad. First of all, the criminal legal system does not give a fuck about your Fourth Amendment rights. If they did, it'd be hard to justify civil asset forfeiture, a practice by which the police seize property that might possibly could have been maybe used in a crime at some point? Perhaps. Hell, you don't even have to be accused of a crime, let alone charged. 
Take the case of Terry Rowland, a 79-year-old retired engineer. He wasn't a big fan of banks because his parents grew up in the Depression, so he had his life savings in cash, but eventually relented in 2019 and asked his daughter to take his $82,000 and open a joint account. Now, while it is legal to have that large amount of cash and to travel with it, and neither Rowland nor his daughter was charged with a crime, the DEA took it all. It took six months, media pressure, and a lawsuit just to get that money back. And that is a pretty good outcome for these kinds of cases. Because in civil asset forfeiture, in order to get your stuff back, you have to affirmatively prove your innocence, which is kind of really hard. I can't prove that Dick Wolf hasn't cooked and eaten a person, but maybe he did. And I think that it's only fair that I should be able to seize his massive media empire until he can prove that he has never ingested human flesh. In fact, this practice is so widespread that federal law enforcement routinely seizes more cash and property than is lost to burglary each year. It's also clear, if you're paying attention to Law & Order, that the show doesn't actually give a fuck about your Fourth Amendment rights, either. While quick to accuse defense attorneys of exploiting loopholes and technicalities, the district attorneys of the Law & Order universe have no problem exploiting those themselves. Here's an episode where our heroes try to use evidence from an illegal search and are able to use it in court because while they did break the law, they didn't do it directly to the defendant, so it's fine. This was a blatant Fourth Amendment violation sanctioned and indeed carried out by the people. Therefore, any evidence found must be suppressed. Mr. Barnett's Fourth Amendment rights were not violated. Linda Cavanaugh certainly were, but she isn't the defendant. Mr. Barnett is. He has no standing to contest a search of someone else's home. Here's an episode where the police get a warrant, then search a different location than the one on the warrant and want to use that evidence. It was executed pursuant to a warrant signed by Judge Fishbein. Only the warrant covered Mr. Sandig's office, which is Suite 242. The tapes were found in Suite 248. The cops of Law & Order just love finding loopholes like this to get around the Fourth Amendment. And because of the nature of the show, where everyone is guilty, usually works out for them. One of my favorite examples of this is an episode of SVU, where the cops go after a flasher who the show tells us is connected to the rapes of three underage girls. The cops assemble a task force and catch the guy in Central Park. And as is always the case on Law & Order, he's definitely the right guy. He's got a rape kit and everything. This is rape toolkit, sir. That's a good collar, Officer Fletcher. The problem is that the cop, the cop who made that arrest, his name's Fletcher, well, he violated the Fourth Amendment, so that evidence is out. There are plenty of legal ways to get this information. I pulled him aside. I requested that he show me the birthmark. I didn't demand it. And when he declined, you violated his Fourth Amendment rights against search and seizure. How could he have made such a rookie mistake? Oh, well, <laughs> that's because Fletcher's not actually a cop at all. Just a vigilante who probably watches too much Law & Order in his spare time. And as convincing as his little charade may have been, Brad Fletcher is a 16-year-old kid who got carried away playing cops and robbers. Now, you would think that this would be bad for the police, a terrible look, but it's actually great news. Fletcher not being a police officer is good news, right? It gets all the evidence back in. Yeah, Hankett's Fourth Amendment protections only extend to illegal search and seizures by cops, not civilians. Of course, our charming rapist has recourse to Sue Fletcher. Have at it. As long as we get our evidence, this just might work out for the best. Because it's never a technicality when the police do it. The judge throws out the evidence anyways, because, like, duh, he was clearly acting as a police operative. Doesn't sound like he was playing a game to me. He wasn't and everything he recovered under the direction of the police is fruit of the poisonous tree and must be excluded. But that doesn't stop anything, because the kid goes vigilante again, breaks into the suspect's home, and finds smoking gun evidence. It's all framed as misguided and dangerous, since he got shot by the homeowner. But ultimately a good thing, since now he's not pretending to be a cop. The ADA even decides to cut Fletcher some slack, since he's gonna be such a good cop, you know, with his lack of regard for the Fourth Amendment. It's the first question on the job interview. If this pans out, you may have bought yourself another shot at the Academy. <laughs> Now, this is not to say that the especially heinous criminals of a show like SVU are in the right. I am not defending their actions. But there's a reason that the Law & Order universe focuses on the most egregious and violent criminals when it's making arguments about skirting civil rights. It's a lot easier for people to stomach. Stifle free speech. Free speech. Okay. Free speech, Sheree Lathan's life. Uh, I don't see the contest. 
The same dynamic is present in this episode of Law & Order, where the district attorney's office pursues murder charges based on evidence found by a private investigator. Evidence that, if found by the police, would have been thrown out immediately. Lance thought it would be prudent to hire his own investigator. Somebody who wouldn't be intimidated by my stepmother. He found this bag in Mrs. Key's bathroom. And inside the bag, he found a smaller bag, which contained... We had it tested. It's coated with insulin. That's how she killed him. And they just take his word for it. I hired a guy and he found this in her bathroom. And the police are like, oh yeah, clearly you're correct. Certainly this was never planted or found somewhere else and is definitely usable evidence. I trust you, sir. Like, what the fuck? We should not tolerate a thinly veiled agent of the government to violate what the framers deemed inviolable. If we do, individuals who can afford a fee of $20,000 for a private investigator would be the recipients of a higher form of justice than those of us who cannot. Law and Order neatly reframes this issue arguing that since the rich can hire private investigators to subvert the Fourth Amendment, I, I don't know, maybe cops should be able to do it too, since since we don't want a two-tier justice system. So, Mr. Stone, uh, while I'm sitting unconscious in my dentist chair, he decides to search my briefcase and finds a gun. Uh, you think it should be admissible against me in a murder trial? The Supreme Court thinks so, Your Honor. And carried to the extreme if a police officer doesn't have sufficient cause to obtain a warrant. He can get a private citizen to do his dirty work. If there is a double standard, Your Honors, we should eliminate it not by lowering the justice available to the wealthy, but by raising the quality of justice for everyone. It's almost as easy to make enemies out of the rich as it is to make them out of sex criminals. And look, I hate the rich just about as much as anyone. But that's not the issue at stake in this case. The issue is whether you can hire a private investigator to break into someone's home, find evidence, present it to the police as fact, and have them use it in their prosecution. I talked a bit about private investigators in the Copaganda episode on Veronica Mars, but even that show makes it very clear that private investigators are not doing the job of the police for them. Imagine how helpful that recording would be if it was obtained legally. Not to mention an actual confession. Note the absence of a silver platter. This was more to steer you in the right direction than to say, do your job for you. You gotta, you gotta go get your own evidence. I think it's also very funny that for as much as the cops and lawyers of Law & Order complain about how the rich have too much money and influence, one of the most prominent district attorneys on the show is Arthur Branch, played by Republican politician Fred Thompson who had close ties to the advocacy group Citizens United, most famous for their 2010 Supreme Court case where they successfully argued that the rich can pour as much money into the political process as they want because money equals free speech. Here he is, using Citizens United money alongside the guy who did Watergate to support the invasion of Iraq, which turned out great. Absolutely great, 10 out of 10 would do it again. It's the soldier who serves under the flag who defends the protesters' right to burn the flag. Isn't it time now to demonstrate that we support our troops? Were it not for the brave, there'd be no land of the free. Well, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get into free speech in a minute. Another thing that Law & Order distorts about the Fourth Amendment is just how willing a judge will be to stand up for your rights. They're boys. Everybody in the court, that's like, they're boys. Like, that's what people don't get. It's like, the judges and them and the prosecutors are like homies. Like, it's there on the side of the court and there it's like, it's the, the, the prosecutor is like, hmm, I, I want this. And the judge is like, fuck this client. And the judge is like, that seems like a good thing to want because fuck that client. And, the, and you're like, no, but I like my client. And they're like, well, fuck you. In reality, the courts don't keep Fourth Amendment violations in check. They kind of just find more and more behavior to actually not be a violation when you think about it. It's pretty much like this. The Fourth Amendment gave you a constitutional right and the Supreme Court passed 16 exceptions to that right. <laughs> like, And every single time, every single time a case comes to the Supreme Court where the police have done something obviously unconstitutional, they say, right, but... But we knew he was a bad guy, right? Hear me out. What if we, what if we let them do it? Ooh, <laughs> what if we let them do it? According to the Fourth Amendment itself, a search or seizure can only occur upon probable cause, which 
is probably a term you've heard before. Look, it's an academic institute. I need some patina of probable cause. There has already been a finding of probable cause to arrest him. May have just gotten a probable cause. Probable cause. Probable cause. People. Women resort to violence only when provoked by male oppression. Oh, your PC crap is killing me. Sorry, got off track. That's a that's a different PC they're talking about. But what is probable cause? It's a uh, pretty vague. It's pretty vague. Basically, it means that there is enough credible and articulable information to suggest evidence of a crime will be discovered upon the search. If you have probable cause, you go to a judge and they give you a warrant and then you get to and then off you go. But that leaves a lot of wiggle room. And over the past 70 years, the robed cops on the Supreme Court have hollowed out the Fourth Amendment like I've hollowed out my Bible to hide weed things. In 1968, the Supreme Court ruled in Terry v. Ohio that a cop can actually stop a person on the street and search their person on the idea of reasonable suspicion, which is also a term with a lot of wiggle room, but whatever it means, it's easier to get than probable cause. Can we extradite him and make him take the blood test? No, without a court order, you can't compel a test, and you can't get a court order without reasonable suspicion. Well, he ran off to LA. That makes me reasonably suspicious. I'm not trying to be Weasley about this. I'm not bad at researching. This shit is murky wherever you look. On the Ask Lawyer subreddit, a lawyer defined a probable cause as, quote, an objectively reasonable, subjective belief that something is probably true. I checked with some lawyers and they assured me that this makes sense, but people of the audience, doesn't that sound confusing as fuck? <laughs> On the Maricopa County website, they try to draw the distinction this way. At the point of reasonable suspicion, it appears that a crime may have been committed. The situation escalates to probable cause when it becomes obvious that a crime has most likely been committed. Which begs the question, when is it obvious that a crime probably happened? Obvious and probably, I don't, I don't know. And what is the level of scrutiny before that? Seriously, I'm not bad at research. I spend a, I spend a lot of time on it. This is just a very murky part of the law. Patreon.com slash skip intro. Anyways, throughout the jurisprudence around stops, searches, and seizures, the Supreme Court has routinely deferred to the police, prioritizing making their jobs easier over the constitutional rights of citizens. Take the case of Michael Wren, who was convicted of drug charges after plainclothes police pulled him over for driving in a high drug area and stopping at a stop sign for 20 whole seconds and turning at an unreasonable speed. Could it have maybe been racial profiling? Not according to the Supreme Court, who, in a unanimous decision, said that the police can follow anyone for as long as they want until they commit the smallest traffic offense, and that qualifies for reasonable suspicion. Wren versus U.S. Supreme Court says you can profile as much as you want as long as there's at least some pretense. I don't think that's what they meant. The police can search your trash. The police can uh, pretext stop you, pull you over, right? Which is to say they can follow you and wait for you to commit one of a myriad of unknown traffic violations, right? That you didn't put your blinker on at the right time. They can use that stop actually because they suspect you of, somebody, of something else and they want to search you for something else. The Supreme Court has said that's fine, right? Hell, the cops don't even have to follow you anymore. In 2014, the court ruled in Navajo Navarrete v. California that the police can pull over a vehicle based purely on an unverified and anonymous tip about reckless driving. In real life, if I call if I call the police right now and I say such and such, if I say my best friend he is calling me a bunch of times and harassing me and blah 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 blah, and uh, they're not they don't need they don't need shit from me. They will issue an I card for her arrest, and when she's arrested for aggravated harassment in third degree, she could go tell the judge that she ain't do it. And now you have a criminal case fighting that you didn't do it. That's how it works. We're kind of jumping out of chronological order here, but in 1989, and this is a good one, in a case called Florida v. Riley, the Supreme Court ruled that the police can circumvent the fence you have for privacy by hopping in a helicopter and surveilling your property from the air without a warrant. That's not considered unreasonable. <sighs> Maybe it seems like that's actually not a crazy thing for the police right. to do because police do use helicopters all the time now. Police do like use crazy equipment and technology for searching people's homes. But that's because of this case. That's because the Supreme Court gave it the thumbs up here. Right. And now it's super common that police use war tactics, basically. Nice. Cool. 
The Supreme Court has even created massive carve-outs for the exclusionary rule, admitting evidence that they themselves admit was unlawfully obtained. If the police use an illegal warrant to search you or seize your property, but they really, really felt that it was legal when they did it, that falls under the good faith exception. That evidence counts. If the police unlawfully find evidence, but we're definitely for sure going to find that evidence lawfully later, then that's considered inevitable discovery. That evidence is into. Inevitable discovery? We come up with Cook's name independently? And we convince a judge that we would have inevitably discovered that he planted that virus? And all the evidence is admissible. Mark Rash, a cybersecurity attorney and former prosecutor for the Department of Justice, lays it out this way on his website. And I'm sorry, this is a long-winded quote, but please stick with me, it's a good one. The inevitable discovery rule coupled with the good faith exception means that even when the court says a warrant is needed to invade privacy, it may not actually be needed. Take the contents of email. It's pretty clear that for the government to intercept and read contents of email for which there is a reasonable expectation of privacy, it needs a warrant. Maybe not you can get the consent of someone else, the person's employer, the provider, or spouse. In fact, the terms of service and terms of use for many commercial email services permit the ISPs to read their customers' emails, private chats, or messages, either by a human being or a robot. The government has argued users abandoned any reasonable expectation of privacy in the contents of the messages and therefore no warrant is required. Alternatively, if the government reads your emails without a warrant, it could argue that it could have. So it's like the police go and get, get something illegally. They go and obtain some evidence illegally. The court goes, right, but even though they technically already know it and found it from this illegal way, if you could show us that y'all can find another way in which y'all could have obtained it, then we'll say it was okay that you got it this way. The independent, you got it from an independent source ex ex aside from this fucked up way you did it. So that's cool. <laughs> but what about something people actually know about? Something really fundamental. Surely Law and Order doesn't try to distort something as fundamental to being an American as the First Amendment, right? Right? Let's end with the only right that a majority of Americans can actually name, freedom of speech. First Amendment, the Constitution? Yeah, that pesky thing. Now, I'm not gonna talk about free speech in any kind of meaningful way here. I'm not gonna talk about the distinctions between freedom of speech and freedom from social consequence. I'm definitely not gonna talk about how freedom of speech is a protection from the state and not from private corporations like Facebook. And I'm not gonna get into some pissing contest about who the real anti-free speech people are. I'm not gonna do it. It's, it's boring. And honestly, it's been done to death ever since Willy Wonka bought Twitter. So I'm sure that whatever I have to say will change absolutely nobody's mind. Instead, I want to focus on how free speech is presented in Law and Order, when it comes up, and what kind of speech is deemed protected compared to reality. I imagine you also consider yourself a proud proponent of the First Amendment. I do. Freedom of speech is the cornerstone of our democracy. The cops and lawyers of Law & Order have what I'd call a begrudging respect for free speech. For them, it's an annoying impediment, and they hate what some people have to say, but it's kind of a third rail that they don't want to touch, as opposed to say, you're right to leave a conversation with the police when you are not under arrest. I want to go home. Thank you. <laughs> the two major issues that the police and lawyers of the Law & Order Extended Cinematic Universe have with the First Amendment is when the free speech involves incitement to violence. He targeted Reed. One of his followers could have taken him seriously. You connect one of the members of Shaw's congregation to the murder, I might be able to get him on the Fighting Words Doctrine. Till then, First Amendment says he can enjoy his civil liberties like everybody else. Or when it's a reporter refusing to disclose their sources. Freedom of the press at any cost, that should generate some nice editorials. Can't have too many friends in the media. It's also a lot of child pornography talk, but I am trying my best not to get demonetized. This one is a disgusting how-to for pedophiles. I gotta say, this is the one time I disagree with the First Amendment. This garbage should be banned. Perverts hiding behind free speech and calling it literature. Also comes up sometimes with regard to fringe religious beliefs like curative intercourse. But I'm gonna stay away from those because I don't think, I don't think I could possibly say curative intercourse again without vomiting. It 
wasn't rape, it was curative intercourse. Mmm. Yummy. Anyways, whenever the press refuses to disclose a source to the police on Law & Order, it's always portrayed as a sleazy, spineless move, usually accompanied by claims that their publication isn't real news anyway. Mr. Griscom has been a journalist for 15 years. Journalist? The Ledger? That's risible. Excuse me, does he have to be here? Mr. Griscom, we're going to need the notes you have on the deleted messages. That's covered by the First Amendment. Oh, so now you're trying to hide behind the First Amendment. You know what? Don't give me this intimidation crap. First Amendment, kids. I'm a journalist. For the National Probe, that's a real respectable publication. <laughs> you see who they're calling tomorrow? An assistant editor of the New York Times. To defend the New York slugs. Slippery slope clear. Might want to get off your high horse about what constitutes journalism, considering creator Dick Wolf has said the Bible for Law & Order is the front page of the New York Post, which, let's just check out what the top story is when I wrote, uh, when I wrote this sentence. Cool. Journalistic integrity is clearly very important to Mr. Dick. Reporters are often portrayed as literal bottom feeders, like in this SVU episode where the Punisher is introduced literally picking through the trash. Just tell us where to start looking. Hey, just give me a call when you get a conscience. These pesky reporters are only in it for the salacious details you see. Not like Law & Order, which is definitely not exploiting real-life sex crimes for personal profit. Definitely not doing that. This kind of opposition to media and the press is where we see some of the earliest 20th century restrictions to the First Amendment. In 1915, the Supreme Court ruled that motion pictures aren't protected as free speech. Not any movies in particular, just all of them. <laughs> And that would remain the precedent all the way up until 1952. Sometimes I wonder what the 1915 Supreme Court would think of Euphoria. I think they'd like it. But these restrictions wouldn't stop at commercial media. In 1917, Congress passed the Espionage Act, which prohibited interference with military operations or recruitment and prevented support of United States enemies during wartime. Good thing. Good thing we're never at war anymore, and this will never come back to haunt us. The act was challenged in the 1919 Supreme Court case Schenck v. United States, where a man named Charles Schenck was sentenced to 10 years for handing out flyers urging men to resist the military draft for World War I. That point was just called the Great War. They didn't know there was going to be a sequel yet. Not that it matters, but his argument was pretty reasonable, saying that conscription isn't constitutional because the 13th Amendment abolished involuntary servitude. And what is a military draft if not involuntary? But you see, we were at war. Things were dangerous. Writing the unanimous opinion of the court, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, back then they all had three names, wrote, quote, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. Yeah, that's where the whole fire in a crowded theater thing comes from. An anti-war dude handing out pamphlets about the draft in 1919. Weird world we live in. <laughs> the Espionage Act wouldn't stop there, though. It would also be used to jail socialist leader Eugene Debs for a speech he gave in 1918, where he had the audacity to say, quote, The working class have never yet had a voice in declaring war. If war is right, let it be declared by the people. You who have your lives to lose. Yeah, he went to jail for that. You shout like that, they, they put you in jail right away. Trump tells a crowd of people with a gallow set up chanting hang Mike Pence to go take action and that's fine. But how dare you say that the people have a voice in declaring war? You monster! While some of the most egregious bits of the Espionage Act would be repealed in 1920, it's still largely on the books and has been used to prosecute whistleblowers like Daniel Ellsberg, Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange, and Edward Snowden. Journalists, we have a special jail for journalists. In fact, this kind of anti-war or socialist speech was the primary target of First Amendment jurisprudence for the first half of the 20th century, culminating in 1968's United States v. O'Brien, where the Supreme Court upheld the conviction of David Paul O'Brien burning his draft card. In the eyes of the court, that didn't qualify as free speech. Now, today, I think most of us would not agree with this line of thinking. Why should speech critical of the government and its policies not be included under free speech? Isn't you know, the point of the First Amendment to protect speech from punishment by the government. Like, 
Like, what are we doing here? Instead, I think people subscribe more to the I hate what you say, but you have a right to say it line of thinking. But his speech, despicable as it may be, doesn't entitle anyone to trample all over his constitutional rights, now does it? And indeed, this is how, when they're not shitting on journalism as a general concept, law and order mostly approaches free speech. Our police officers and prosecutors frequently run into speech that makes them really, really mad, only to be reminded that actually, it's legal to say those things. And what speech is it that makes law and order cops really mad? Well, it's almost exclusively the most bigoted speech you can think of. So what the hell do you do here, huh? Exercise our First Amendment right to free speech. We weren't out to hurt anybody. Besides, it's free speech. It's protected. That doesn't cover death threats, Matt. I'm talking about the yearbook. I never threatened anybody. Oh, yeah. Kill all c**ks. I guess you meant that in a nice way. Okay, protest is over, ref. This is a legal demonstration. Well, not anymore. Sit down. You're trespassing. So you have the right to say anything you want to on the air. God bless the First Amendment. Ah, yeah, but free speech does have its limits. I mean, you can't yell, fire in a crowded theater. You can if the building's burning. And make no mistake, this country is ablaze. Now, it's not like Law & Order is promoting these viewpoints. In fact, they often try to prosecute that speech as an incitement to violence. Usually the debate comes down to something like this. Someone somewhere says something or writes something that's morally gross, but protected speech. Then someone else commits an awful crime inspired by that speech, and our cops try to go after the guy who said it in the first place for inciting violence. This is speech protected by the First Amendment. With these instructions, the new Sons of Liberty advocate illegal use of automatic weapons. It's no longer free speech. It's a verbal act, an illegal act. Like with all of the rights we've talked about today, there is a double effect that comes from this portrayal. The first is to paint the criminal legal system in opposition to white supremacy, which is very silly. You might be asking, why is it silly? Well, remember the whole shouting fire in a crowded theater thing being used to silence free speech and how that was bad? Well, that decision in Schenck wouldn't be overturned until 1969 in a case called Brandenburg v. Ohio. There, the Supreme Court decided that an Ohio law that broadly prohibited advocacy of violence was unconstitutional. So what kind of speech was in question here? We finally getting some justice for the socialists? Maybe maybe a little Black Panther stuff going on? Maybe, uh, maybe someone protesting Vietnam? No. The defendant was Clarence Brandenburg, a leader of the Ku Klux Klan, who gave a speech saying, quote, Our president, our Congress, our Supreme Court continues to suppress the white Caucasian race in front of a crowd of armed men in robes and hoods burning a cross. But how dare you make a constitutional argument about the draft or say that people have a say in war? That, that is bad. Now, I'm not here to make an argument about what free speech should be defined as. I just think that it's interesting how the Supreme Court routinely upheld convictions for speech when it was socialist or anti-war, but then they found out the KKK was also being silenced, and all of a sudden they think, we gotta fix that. When it's the free speech of bigots on the right, like when the American Nazi Party wants to hold a rally in Skokie, Illinois, because that's where a bunch of survivors of the Holocaust live, or when the Boy Scouts want to kick out homosexuals despite a state law requiring equal treatment, well then the Supreme Court steps in and says, it's high time we change our interpretation of free speech. I mean, are we really America without the bigotry? Now, you may be saying, hey, we got it wrong before and now we've course corrected. You should never be jailed for something you say. And now the court recognizes that. No, they don't. Come on. Just a few years ago, in the 2019 case Neves v. Bartlett, the Supreme Court ruled that if you tell a cop to fuck off and that you won't answer their questions, well, they can then arrest you and say, bet you wish you would have talked to me now, and it's still not a retaliatory arrest. So, still some things you can't say. So, a <laughs> uh, cop sees you driving your 2009 Honda Accord oh. with a Bernie bumper sticker, right? Uh -huh. He doesn't like that because he recently saw a Newsmax piece about what's happening in Venezuela. <laughs> so, he follows you until you commit a minor traffic violation. He talks to you, and he claims to smell marijuana, although he's lying. He calls for a canine unit and makes you wait for it to arrive. Yep, all legal. That takes about half an hour. Finally arrives. When it does, the dog smells drugs, but not marijuana. The cops search your car and find a baggie of cocaine because you're cool and you go to parties sometimes. <laughs> they cuff you and haul you to jail. The cop says, bet you regret that Bernie sticker now, you commie piece of shit. And you're like, what? And then he says, that's why I'm arresting you because of that sticker. 
Everything I did after seeing that sticker was a pretextual <laughs> effort to punish you for exercising your constitutional right to free speech. And then he does sort yeah. of a maniacal laugh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Per this case, I swear to God, the situation <laughs> I just described is not a violation of your constitutional rights. The second effect of aligning free speech with despicable people is to demonize defense attorneys as schemers, hypocritically and shamelessly manipulating the system to let evil people walk free. This happens a lot, but I think it's probably best exemplified from this season 4 episode where James Earl Jones defends a white supremacist accused of being a serial killer. And the episode just, just loves pointing out the hypocrisy of this situation. What's in it for him? First he gets sympathy and he trots out McCoy to show he's not a bigot. That's why you hired him. In this way, Law & Order aligns free speech with hate speech, minimizing the importance of that right and implying that the only people who make free speech arguments are despicable people and erasing the speech that has actually been repeatedly targeted by courts over the years. We can all agree that what we see powerfully affects us, but that doesn't excuse us from being decent human beings or from making moral choices. What we choose to watch and how we react is up to us. So this is usually the part of these videos where the host tells you, hey, it's just a TV show, or look, I'm not telling you not to watch this. And for the 300th time, I know Law & Order is just a TV show. I know it's meant to be entertainment. And honestly, I am not even telling you not to watch it. It's completely fine to enjoy it. But why do you watch it? I'm talking specifically to the people who are still here after almost two hours of me telling you how harmful this franchise's distortion of the truth is. Because I know there are those of you out there. When I shared part one of this video on Twitter, I had a lot of people responding something along the lines of, I love trash so I knew this was bad, but it's so much worse than I thought. To an extent, I understand the impulse, especially when it comes to SVU. It's comforting to see the police as an institution actually invested in sex crimes, since the real police do not. Nationwide, there are tens of thousands of untested rape kits. A 2018 ProPublica report notes that the NYPD's middling 40% clearance rate for rape cases is largely inflated. Journalist Meg O'Connor of The Appeal estimates that the real figure is closer to 25%. At the same time, the NYPD boasts an epidemic of workplace sexual harassment. It's also incredibly easy to find news stories about NYPD cops assaulting civilians. Also in 2018, the city of New York found that assaults between strangers had been given priority by the police higher-ups over assaults where assailants knew their victims, which is mega fucked up considering that the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network estimates that 80% of sexual abuse cases are perpetrated by people the victim knows. Hell, the real-life NYPD SVU is so bad that they are currently under investigation from the Department of Justice for, quote, failing to conduct basic investigative steps and instead shaming and abusing survivors and re-traumatizing them during investigations. So I understand the allure of viewers, especially women, wanting to watch a show where sex crimes committed overwhelmingly against them as a population are effectively policed and prosecuted. I mean, it's not the truth, but I definitely get the impulse. But outside of that specific perspective, I don't get it. I've watched a lot of cop shows for this series, and in most of them, I was able to find something I enjoyed. Maybe it was the chemistry of the cast, some jokes here or there, or just the attempt to grapple with difficult material, even if it definitely fell short. You know, in Lucifer, there was the crazy batshit energy. And what is it you desire, Tim? I want to build a cat sanctuary. But on The Rookie, there was that catchy song. You know the one. Tell me some meds, please, so I can get arrested by this daddy of a cop with his daddy cop walk and his daddy cop arms and his daddy cop butt. Ow! And in Blue Bloods, I found joy in tearing that franchise down to the ground. It's the final season coming up, baby! We did it. We killed Blue Bloods. You, me, we did it together. Yeah, that's right. Run away, little piggy, run away. But what is it that people get out of Law & Order? 
It's almost completely humorless as a franchise. Whenever there's a joke or something that we're meant to laugh at, it tends to draw attention to some really grim aspect of the crime, or a civil rights violation that the cops are steamrolling. Hey, I'm asking you a question. What's the charge? Oh, there's no charge. This one's on us. While SVU might be aspirational when it comes to a police department that cares about sex crimes, it is certainly not aspirational about humanity. These episodes have some of the most depraved plot lines I've ever seen. Stuff that I'm not sure I can repeat on YouTube without getting demonetized. Here, Google the episode titled Resilience. That shit's fucked up. But seriously, what is it about this series that people still like? There is nothing that Law & Order provides that you could not find in a better TV show, likely done in a more tasteful and artful way. Maybe you like the realistic feel of the show and its low opinion of the current state of society. Just watch The Wire. You like the structure and rhythm of a police procedural? Watch Veronica Mars. You like watching a thumb-shaped badge daddy smash some heads? Watch The Shield. You're into really mega fucked up sex crimes? Watch Hannibal. You like that New York City is a character in the show? Watch Sex in the City. If I could be so bold, I think that what Law & Order sells that people really want is the concept of order. Bad guys do bad things and get punished. It's a very natural human impulse. Who wouldn't want to see some real justice for the Sackler family or for George W. Bush to be tried in The Hague for war crimes rather than getting his own masterclass? Law & Order assures you that while there's a lot of bullshit in the world, there are people out there fighting the good fight. And those good people are cops. But I'm not worried. Why? Because everything always works out for the best. But it's important to remember that, like Kenneth Parcell, the show is lying to you. Every morning when I wake up, I say everything's going to be OK, but I'm lying. In reality, our courts aren't where justice has been administered, but instead where injustice has been codified. This isn't an institution that keeps the police in check. It's one that has capitulated to the police at all levels. Courts are an important backstop where other branches of government have failed to rein cops in. And if the Supreme Court did it well, if they stepped in and defended First Amendment rights here, defended Fourth Amendment rights in other cases, it would not matter that police unions have secured such a level of political control. Their control would be slowly eroded by the fact of their violence by the fact that they assert themselves over the community right. in such an aggressive, unconstitutional way. And the police have taken that freedom to do what they were designed to do from the beginning, monitor and manage poor people and people of color. I talked about this back in my video on Paw Patrol, because, I mean, where else would you talk about this? But the earliest forms of American policing come from, in the South, slave patrols, and in the North, business owners attempting to squash unions. While I would love to say, I'm not telling you what to watch or what to like or whatever, and while I do feel that way about most of the shows I talk about on this channel, I don't really think that we can make any progress on policing, prisons, criminal justice reform, or abolition if law and order remains such a large piece of American culture, defining our baseline understanding of the law. Even if you understand the issues with the franchise, even if you watch knowing the facts, you're still consuming something that is designed from top to bottom to erode your understanding of your rights and get you to defer to the police. It continually reinforces the idea that contact with the system is evidence of guilt and equates crucial liberties to mere technicalities. It minimizes the importance of those rights and parrots conservative talking points about them tailored to steer public opinion to be amenable to their repeal. While I do take complete personal credit for this being the final season of Blue Bloods, obviously no single one of us can make Law & Order not popular. But I also think that until enough people have killed that little Law & Order voice in their heads, we're not going to get very far. At the very least, if you need Olivia Benson to get your badge mommy fix, just, just pirate the show. Don't give these people your money. Media both reflects and shapes the way we understand society around us, and with that in mind, I think it's important to continually remind ourselves what kind of social context a piece of media emerges from. Earlier in this two-parter, I talked about how the tough-on-crime conservative rhetoric of the 70s, 80s, and 90s paved the way for law and order success, but sometimes political actors put an even bigger thumb on the scales when it comes to media. Back in the late 1940s, before films were considered free speech, Hollywood and the House Un-American Activities Committee cracked down on all liberal and left-wing thought in film, blacklisting anyone who had ever been associated with progressive political movements. We will forthwith discharge or suspend without compensation 
those in our employ, and we will not re-employ any of the ten until such time as he is acquitted or has purged himself of contempt and declares under oath that he is not a communist. The result was a huge chilling effect on anything that might get writers canceled, one that lasted for decades, during which many early television conventions and norms were forged. And you can learn all about that history in the documentary Red Hollywood, which is available to stream on this video's sponsor, Mubi. Mubi is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all around the globe. It is an incredible collection of high-quality cinema that you won't find anywhere else. Films that look at the world from a different perspective than our boring old cop shows. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there is always something new to discover on Mubi. The hand-selected curation will take you across the globe and give you a different view on things that you took for granted. Right now, you can try Mubi for free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash skip intro. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash skip intro for a whole month of great cinema for free. And of course, thank you for watching. Please share, like, subscribe, do the, do the YouTube stuff. Um, if you're feeling extra generous, you can head over to Patreon. I have my full interviews with Rhiannon and Olay there, and I got some other uh, perks like monthly mailbags, monthly TV roundups, early access to videos, my little videos, and um, even going to be starting to do some live watch-alongs. Um, one of the first ones that we, we did was the one of the newest episodes of this season of Law & Order, and it was a fucking doozy let me tell you so um yeah those are all the things you can do you can also get your name scrolling in through the credits which is cool and uh thank you so much for watching uh this was a lot of work and i really appreciate everyone who stuck around to the end anyone who you know gets movie anyone who uh supports the channel through patreon it's all incredibly appreciated and i couldn't do this without you guys so talk at you again soon I don't know if you know, it's just me. I'm the only person, skip intro is just me. Um, I've been doing the whole thing out of this studio apartment for like years at this point. And uh, actually, this is actually where my bed usually is. I have to move it out of the way to shoot. I have to rearrange my entire apartment to shoot every time. Um, Patreon.com slash skip intro.